Hello everyone and welcome to this next sound design lecture where we will be concentrating on parameter automation in the Web Audio API. We'll be looking at audio parameters, how they can be modified, so their timing, scheduling and construction of envelopes. So let's begin. First, a little bit of background. Automation is a big deal in audio production. It's essentially any form of automating tasks. So having the digital audio workstation or mixing console do some of the tasks for you. And one of the main ways this is done is, and I just noticed a little typo. One of the ways this is done is by assigning automation curves to change the fader level. So uh, to slowly have the volume ramp up or ramp down or follow any sort of arbitrary curve. So look at what's being done here. This is an example, uh, I think from an isotope plugin, but could be really from anything. And if you look on the right, there is the automation curve changing the volume across the track over time, ramping it up, then ramping it down. And you can see the fader or slider on the far left moving up and down as it traverses those curves. So that's the idea. And that's the link between the automation curve on the right, the fader on the left. Okay, so how do we do this with the Web Audio API? So even without thinking of automation, you have the ability to change any of the audio parameters. They can be changed by just directly setting the level. So if you have an oscillator called tone and you want to change its frequency, then simply setting tone.frequency.value sets the frequency, the value of the frequency parameter of that tone to whatever you want, in this case 200 hertz. You could also connect a node directly to uh, a parameter. So uh, the gain node here is connected to the tone's frequency. You don't need to uh, connect it to the value of the frequency because it will automatically connect the value of uh, the gain node's output to the value of that frequency. And you can connect several things to a parameter. So if you have, say, the first line here followed immediately by the second line, then it will add the 200 hertz value of that tone with the output of the gain node. And if you add that output of several different nodes, well, if you connect the output of several different nodes, all of those values will add to the parameter value. And so that's a very powerful tool, and we'll look at using that sort of um, uh, feature, connecting nodes to parameters, we'll look at it when we deal with things like uh, frequency modulation. We also have the ability to schedule events. So every parameter has a list of events, initially empty, that define when and how that value changes. You can set the value at a particular time, you can set the value again at another time, and as you will see, you can uh, ramp the value over time. All of these events are essentially a timeline that provide automation curves for how the parameter changes and can do, it, do those changes at very precise times. So this allows someone to program all of that automation that one can create in an audio workstation. So what sort of parameter scheduling do we have? The basic scheduling, just setting the value at a given time. You can set the value over and over again and sort of artificially create a ramp of that value. Every, the um, method set value at time performs an instantaneous change to a value at whatever time you specify. So it doesn't have to happen now. You can schedule it to happen one second in future. There's also the ability to do a linear ramp to the value at time, which changes the value from whatever was the previous value in this list of automation events to whatever is the new value that is specified to happen at an end time. So you can linearly ramp a value from zero to one, 
linearly ramp the value back down from one to zero or whatever you want to, to do. Similar to a linear ramp, there is an exponential ramp to a value at time. The method is called in exactly the same way, but it performs what's known as an exponential ramp, where it might grow over time, starting from the previous value, ending at the specified end time at the end value. So this is how it looks. If the value was V0, uh, previously and you are ramping up to v1 and the initial time the previous time was t0 and you end at time t1 then you have this first equation here that the value at any given time equals v0 times v1 over v0 to that exponent so what happens when the time has reached t1 then you have t1 minus t0 over t1 minus t0 in the exponent that becomes 1 so it's just v0 times v1 over v0 so at time t1 you know it will reach that end value v1 which is what's wanted note here that you can't set v0 to 0 or you can't have v0 being zero and you can't set the final value to v1 uh, sorry the final value v1 to zero so if v0 is zero you have a division by zero here and you are also multiplying by zero there uh, so you won't have an automation curve that moves from one value to another you might generate an error if v1 is set to zero then you are going to stay at the initial value of all time and never start to move up to that final value. So when using the exponential ramp, you should make sure if, say, you want to start at zero, that you actually start very close to zero, 0 0.0001 or something like that. And similarly with the, the final value. Then there's another form of exponential movement which is actually the more traditional form, it, how a lot of analog circuits move. It's the set target at a time. So you specify your start time, and then you exponentially move toward a target at a rate. So you may never reach that final target, but you're always exponentially moving, toward, moving towards it. You might move down to zero, never fully get there. And finally, there's one more method, which is you specify an array of values scaled to, f uh, um, and the curve will follow those array of values over whatever duration you give. So if you, you can specify values between, um, over one second, and that array will give you a curve that gets interpolated and scaled to fit that one second. We'll look at all of these. So first off, let's compare the curves because we have three sort of built-in types of curves that can be done. So in each of these curves, what's going to be done is over a time of one second, we're going to move from a value 0 0.5 towards 2 or something close to 2. If I do a linear ramp over one second from 0 0.5 to 2, that's this blue line right here, straight movement. And here's how it might be called. Linear ramp to value at time. Give the value first, then the end time. Uh, and here's how it looks with the actual value set. If I do an exponential ramp to a value at time, it will still start at exactly 0 0.5, still end at exactly 2, but it exponentially moves, starting slowly and then fast, and hits that value. If I do the set target at time, then I start at 0 0.5, as stated, and I move towards the value of 2, but I never fully get there. If I move towards uh, the value of 2 over 100 seconds, I'd still be out here, still getting closer and closer to 2, but never getting there. The form, the format, is also quite a bit different. You specify the target, which is like the value first, 
but you need to specify the start time. There is no necessary end time because it's always moving towards that value, but you specify the time constant, how quickly it moves towards that value. Does it, uh, sorry, does it go very quick or does it go very slowly towards the value? And as you can see, although both the exponential ramp and set target at time are a form of exponential movement, the forms that they produce are quite different. With certain settings, you can get them quite close, but generally they're quite different functions. Okay, so we're going to give a simple example here. We're going to create a sort of beep sound. So we'll have a, a burst of an oscillator. Uh, in this case, we'll pick a sawtooth wave. And by a burst, what I mean is the amplitude of that oscillator is going to be zero in the beginning. And then we increase the amplitude so it gets up to one and then decrease it back down again. And if we do that over a short enough period of time, it just sounds like a little beep sound. How do we do that changing of the amplitude? We connect the oscillator to a gain node and we change the gain of that gain node using, in this case, the linear ramp. So we're going to have in the HTML file three adjustable parameters, frequency, attack, and delay. Attack is how long uh, it takes for it to ramp up. Decay is how long it takes for it to ramp down. And we will uh, oh, oh, also notice that the timing in the Web Audio API is in seconds, not milliseconds. But people are used to dealing with milliseconds when they work with attack and delay. So we'll have these parameters actually be values in milliseconds. That means that when we deal with the attack and the delay in the Web Audio API, we're going to divide them by 1000 so that we get values back in, in seconds that we can work with. So we create an oscillator. We connect that to the volume, which is a gain node, it's initially set with a gain of zero. Connect that to our destination and we start the oscillator. This is not going to produce any sound by itself, but when we click on a button called trigger beep, then we start the audio context. We specify the current time, or we find the current time, and we call that time now. And we do this simply because I'm going to be using that value of current time over and over again. I could actually call current time over and over again, but it's a lot, it's more text, and also the current time will be slightly different after each timing. So I want it to be exact. So first, at that current time, now, we set the value to zero. And that's because although it's set, although the gain was set to zero, we don't know if I click the, the beep button multiple times, it will always be zero. So this resets it back to zero. Then we ramp up to one. And the time it takes to do so is whatever the attack value was given in seconds. And then we ramp it back down to zero. And now we do this, the precise end time for that is that initial current time plus this attack time plus the decay time. So that total time for the beep later. Let's have a listen. Hopefully you all heard that. I can change the frequency. I can change the attack. And I can change the decay. Also notice that I did this slightly differently than how I've done it in uh, some of these previous web audio examples. 
where previously I usually used just a slider, here I have a, a text box that takes numerical input, so I have very precise control. I can enter, for instance, an attack time of 50.55 milliseconds. And I did that going back to the HTML just by rather having it be a range control, have it be a number, an input of uh, the number type. Okay, so that's, that's a beep. Now, I can create that beep repeating. So beep, beep, beep. And how do we do that? Here, we actually go outside of the Web Audio API because the function is already there in JavaScript with something called set interval. Set interval is simply a way to create a function that will repeat every specified time. So uh, the set interval method takes a function and takes a time. And this is not part of the Web Audio API, again, this is JavaScript uh, uh, from a different API, and it uses milliseconds. S and then if someone wants the, this repeat to stop, then clear interval needs to be called. If you want something to happen at a specific time, well, that functionality is in the Web Audio API, but there's also the general set timeout function in JavaScript ca that can do that. Here, we're not going to use clear interval, so it will repeat forever when we're on the web page. And we're, we do want it repeating, so we're not using set timeout. So we use set interval. So it's going to be the same sort of JavaScript that we saw before, only we're going to hard code the attack and decay to 100. I just did it so we have a small self-contained uh, file here. And we have this trigger beep function uh, start the or resume the audio context, but then everything about creating that beep sound is within this interval so that it repeats. And we set it to repeat every one second. Let's hear that. Now that sounds faster than one second, so I think in the code, I probably slightly deviated while playing around with this. So. Oh no, that is set to a, uh, one second. Okay, so that is repeating a beep. And then how do we work with the set value curve? I already showed you uh, just on a slide, not as an example, uh, the exponential uh, curves. So how they, how one does the call rather than a linear ramp to a value, exponential ramp to value at time, set target at time. Uh, if you were to do the same code we just did with the exponential ramp to value, you might want to, or you would want to have it start not at zero, but at a small value like 0 0.001 and have it end not at exactly zero. And if you want to replace the linear or exponential ramp with setting the target, you do it as shown. Okay, let's get back to the slides. What if we want to use a value curve instead? So what that means is you need to create an array of uh, floating points using the JavaScript uh, array float32 array. Just means it's high precision uh, values. And then you use that as input to the set value curve at time function or method. So 
same sort of code that we saw before for the beep, pretty much exactly the same until you get to here where we define this array and we set the values of the array to be a sine wave. So uh, the curve is going to go like this and then back down. We only do half a period of a sine wave. So rather than two times pi, we just have pi. So um, it's going to go, I hope I did that. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen is we'll do the rising and the falling part, and then it'll almost fall down to zero, one value before zero, and then, um, well, that's it for the curve. So we specify the curve values, and we have that um, when the beep is triggered, we uh, start the audio context, we specify the current time. We set the frequency to whatever is the current setting of frequency on the interface. And we set the value curve to go over that curve. And then at the end, because the final value is not quite zero, um, we reset that value to zero. So what's the difference between this set value curve and just setting the value at a given time, well, we need to specify yeah, so if we were to do, say, a linear ramp, we would specify the value and the time. If we set the value at a time, we also specify the value and the time. But here, we specify the value curve the current time, and we need to specify the duration. Again, we're giving this duration in seconds, so we're dividing this uh, value of milliseconds by seconds to get back to zero. How does this work? Let's have a look. Or listen. And that's it. That's the code that you just saw. Okay, so before moving on, this gives us all of that automation functionality that we just talked about. We can have the, um, the fader values on a mixing console that we create in the Web Audio API change in arbitrary curves. And we can do this not just to volumes, we can change frequency that way. We can have uh, one oscillator go into the frequency parameter of another oscillator or mix um, controls almost in any way that we want. We might have a later lecture talking about the constant source node where we'll use the constant source node to create, to control many parameters at the same time. So this is it, this is the automation. Now let's deal with a few subtleties here. So there's two more things that can be done with the parameters. We can simply cancel all scheduled values, which cancels anything that we have scheduled, any future changes uh, from a given time onwards, or we can use the cancel and hold at time which cancels all the scheduled future changes, but it also holds whatever is the value um, that has been created during one of those changes and holds it until another change is made. So it's not obvious how these are going to work and it's not obvious what the difference is between cancel scheduled values and cancel and hold at time. So we're going to look at three examples. First here, we uh, specify our current time. We set an initial uh, value, which is zero. So here we have a constant source node, just emits a constant value based on whatever is the offset value. And we set that offset to zero initially. And then it's going to go through a linear ramp to a value over one second. So it linearly ramps from zero to one and 
over one second and nothing else. So in other words, if we don't have a cancel scheduled values or a cancel and hold at time, what happens? Well, ramps from the current time to one stays at that value forever. Now let's look at another example. Here we're going to cancel the scheduled values at time one half. So um, our plan is to ramp from zero to one over one second, but so sometime in between zero and one, we say, let's cancel that, uh, or let's cancel it there. What that ends up doing is it cancels this whole linear ramp because the time at which we are canceling it is in that planned ramp. So it doesn't do anything. It stays at the value zero. Now, what if we say cancel and hold at time? So we have planned a ramp from zero to one, but instead we're now saying, well, at time half a second, let's just hold that value forever and cancel everything beyond that. So it does perform this linear ramp, but only the first half second of it, and then it stays fixed. Generally, well, it really depends on the use, but there's plenty of uses where you might want to hold the value. I think initially with the Web Audio API, they only implemented the cancel scheduled values, and then they realized how problematic it might be, and so introduced the cancel and hold. Many cases you don't need to do this. So in the previous examples, the beep, we had it so that um, it ramps back down to zero. So we didn't need to cancel it. But you can imagine situations where, for instance, someone might press the beep button several times uh, without it ever being reset, without one ever setting the value initially or setting it back to zero. Maybe uh, you want it to reset, and so you implement the cancel schedule values. Maybe you just want it to keep going from wherever it was, and so you might implement it in different ways. Okay, so that concludes this short lecture on parameter automation and looking at a little bit at automation as a concept in audio production and sound design, but also how it's implemented in the web audio API. There, there's plenty of other things that can be done in automa automation. We'll talk about some other mixing aspects in later lectures. We'll talk about grouping of sources in later lectures. And one thing that's often done in sound design, less so in music, but more so if, say, one's working with audio effects and with certain types of experimental music, is to randomly set parameters. So you might want to keep hearing how something sounds if you change it slightly in various different ways and just have random settings. And we'll look at ways in which those sorts of things can be done in later lectures as well. So that's it for now. As always, please get in touch if you have any questions or comments. And thank you very much. Bye.